This is a little band joke. Just before we introduce our very special guest for today, who is Marcel Marceau, and I'm absolutely thrilled to have him here because, as you know, he is the absolute master of mime and world. The band has asked me to ask them what they intend playing as, their, as the play-on for Marcel Marceau. So can I hear what you're going to play for Mr Marceau? Sir? OK. Cool. <laughs> That's our I promised I'd do it for them. That's their little, little band show. Now you, you hear what they're really going to play as I introduce to you the man uh, who is uh, acknowledged right throughout the world as the absolute master of mime, the, the language of, uh, of our next guest is certainly universal. And just before he comes on set, please have a look at the, the sort of material that he's, he's famous for. of a very nice man. Please welcome Mr. Marcel Marceau. It's wonderful to see you again. Welcome to the show. Thank you very much. <laughs> <laughs> That's especially for the band, though. Yeah. I wonder, I mean, an artist uh, in your situation, world famous and the best at, at what you do, do you ever tire or get annoyed with the, the jokes like, you know, I love Marcel Marceau, I've got all these records and I went to see his concert and couldn't hear anything he said and all that. Does that ever annoy you or tire you? No, very often I think you have to keep always fresh. The only moment I was saying no was in Silent Movie with Mel Brooks. Mm -hmm. You know, the film uh, Mel Brooks did right. Silent Movie. And I remember he called me and said, Marcel, I make a silent film, but <clears throat> I would like you just to say no. You will be the only person who will talk. And I said, Mel, if I have to be the only person who says just no, anybody can say no. They can put on a white face and say no. Then we found walking against the wind, trying to reach the telephone, almost falling from the, the window because there is a big wind, and they are all waiting if I'm accepting to make the sign of movie. They are all waiting. <laughs> and, and I said, I said, Marcel Marceau, it's written down. Do you accept to make a, f a film with us, but sign of movie? And I say, no. And of course. <laughs> <laughs> Well, I, I guess you'd, you'd have to be paid a lot of money for that because they, they asked Harpo Marx many years ago to speak in a movie and they, I think they offered him back in the, the 40s something like a half a million dollars. <laughs> Did you know Harpo Marx? Yes, I knew him very, very well. And, um, you know, Harpo was a wonderful man. And um, I remember I, when, I, when I did my show in America, which I did almost every year, uh, Harpo came to the show and after, he called me in his home and he played harp for me. Mm -hmm. And you know, he told me a very funny story. He learned from a French teacher in New York. And then he started to have such a gift for harps, you know, that he played in his own special way, like this. And after one month, the teacher said, listen, Harpo, when you do this, how do you do? And then he was starting to give lessons to his teacher. Isn't that beautiful? <laughs> What sort of a voice did he have? I spoke beautifully, very calm. He was a, a, a wonderful bridge player. He liked to play cards. He was, you know, uh, he said to me, Marcel, I would like to enter your company. I said, we can never pay you. He said, no, no, he would do it even for nothing. I would, I would like to play pantomime again because it was a time at the end of the 50s, they didn't make any film anymore. And Groucho was just on television. Mm -hmm. uh, Chico, uh, I don't know what Touring Chico with did. His band, I think. Maybe he was fishing, I don't mm -hmm. know. And, uh, and Harpo was really very quiet family man. And 
completely bald. Was he really? Yes, because he had the wig, you mm. know? But he was, he had great charm, absolutely a face, let's say an angel, you know? He was like, in, he was not crazy, he never played crazy. He was very, yes, nice. Oh, yes, is that so? You see? And I remember he said something very interesting. He showed me the props he used in his films. And then he shows me uh, his props, and there was a gun. And I was making a joke, I take the gun, and I did this, he said, Marcel, never put a gun, even when it's a toy, against your, uh, I don't know how you say temple. it in English, temple, because anything can happen. It's, and he was absolutely right, you mm. see. Mm. Uh, People like yourself and Harpo, uh, you are such individual performers. How do you start off to be a mime artist? Is it something which is God-given or something that you create yourself? No, I think it's, it's God-given, if you want to say that. I say for laughing, I was a mime in the womb of my mother already. Uh, since I was a child, uh, I, I saw Chaplin films and I started to imitate Chaplin. I stole the bullet from my father, ink, and I started to, to work in the streets, you see, and, and start to do Chaplin. And my aunt had, a, a, I would say, a summer campus. And children came from all France. And I started, my mother put me there, not to get rid of me, mm. but it was a summertime and there were holidays. And I started to create theater with children. And all the children wanted to come back every year because they did mime theater with them, without knowing what mime was. Mm. Of course, we saw our heroes were all the, the Western heroes and Chaplin, and, and I remember Robert, uh, no, Robin Hood yes. with Errol Flynn. You know, these were the great, the three lances of Bengal. These, they brought all those, even Shelley Temple, you mm -hmm. know, at that time. And when I was 20 years old, I decided to go to a drama school in Paris. And here I met the man who was my master, Etienne de Cru, who was a grammarian. That means he made out of very old art form, he created a new grammar. You know, like dancers have a grammar, mm -hmm. pirouette, mm -hmm. the attitude. We have a complete athletic grammar. And I was his disciple, but there were no mimes anymore. Mime was a tradition was completely lost at the First World War, when the silent movies started. It was a French tradition mm -hmm. with a white-faced Harlequin we call Pierrot. And then De Cruz started a whole new grammar. And he called it statuaire mobile, mobile statuary. Slow motion movements, body movements, and it was very difficult. But nobody was interested. We were three to do it. De Cruz, Jean-Louis Barrault, and myself. Jean-Louis Barrault, became a great uh, director for spoken theater. Mm -hmm. He renounced mime, and I decided to bring it back. And I created my character, Mr. Bip, with a white face, and I created a company, and I traveled all over the world, and I, I'm responsible, really, for the renaissance of this art in this second half of century. Well, you certainly are. I, I'm, as a, a television compere, I, <clears throat> I'm not one of those that looks at the monitor a hell of a lot, but I, I remember having interviewed you some years ago. I, I'm doing exactly the same thing today as I did then, and that is that face of yours, you are drawn to... I mean, I'm, I'm so close to it, it doesn't matter, but there's an added dimension even that theatre and television does for your face. I mean, the camera yes. likes you. But you know, the difference is this. When you play in the theatre, you can sculpt space, you see? You can create emotion through timing, slow motion. I do the cage, or I try to go out of the cage. There's a butterfly. Uh, I, will sculpt, I will sculpt, I will be a painter, a sculptor. I, I will eat a piece of cake, excuse me. <laughs> <laughs> I will be a snake coming out, you see? <laughs> and I will lean against a, a table, you see, I will take a glass, you see, take the glass, thank you. Then I have to be very careful not to become smaller and smaller. Mm -hmm. It has to keep the same size. Okay, thank you. And 
you have to measure the volume. If I, you have to become the water, you have to become the glass. When I am a bird, and if I glide in space, I have to become what I portray. Now, in the theater, you can create magic, silence, music, we use music too. Mm -hmm. But in television, people think it's a trick, very often, you see? And they don't realize so much that uh, when I did the skater, you see, people think, oh, maybe he put soap on the floor. Mm -hmm. And we were, if there, was, there is no soap, or when I, I am on a tightrope, I have the feeling that I'm 10 feet high. And in the theater, the imagination of the public sees what is not there. Yeah, would this be it, suitable for you to show us the skater? No, uh, but I, I show you something else. Mm -hmm. I show you, I give an example, but yep. it should be uh, the whole body, of course. Let's imagine that I go upstairs, upstairs. Right. Right. Then I will look here, and I will, it has to be nobody. I will just, you see, yes. And I have to keep the, see? Pacing, you know, and and I arrive, and I decide to go downstairs, you know. <laughs> Another example. There's a number I do because I brought in, in uh, to Melbourne and to Australia for a new tour. I brought seven, eight new creations. Mm -hmm. And one creation is called the Eater of Hearts, you know? A man who eats hearts. A criminal, a sort of Dr. Jekyll and Hyde. And then when I, I, I started to work it, people said, oh, it's terrible. My God, how can you eat a heart? I think, but in the theater, we can create magic, poetry. There is no blood. It's not goring. We, it's a metaphor. Exactly when I have a knife, the knife appears and disappears. Object appear and disappear, like a magician. And when I am flying as an angel, for instance, there's another number called the angel, then when I fly, I have really to fly in air being on the ground. And this illusion you can really only have in the theater. In the theater itself. Yes. Yeah. Because when you do television, you have to transpose for television, I think. Well, I don't know. What we saw today, it proves once again that, <clears throat> you know, someone doing a show like this has the opportunity of, of meeting some great people. But it's, it's not very often that a compere has the opportunity of talking to someone who does his thing better than anybody else in the world. And that is Marcel Marcel. <laughs> I hope you can stay just a little while, can you? And you suddenly, you also suddenly realise that all your own movements are, are so awkward. So I won't do it. After this break, a huge fan of yours is going to join us, aren't we all fans of yours? Jane Clifton's with us. We'll see you soon. <laughs>